The impossible happened to Lake Michigan, and nobody saw it coming. In just six years, water levels rose by six feet, a change scientists said would take 30 to 40 years. Docks that were stranded on dry land in 2013 vanished underwater by 2020. Families who bought homes with comfortable distances from the shoreline watched their backyards crumble into the waves. This isn't a story about climate change predictions or computer models. This is about measurements, real data collected every single day showing something that breaks everything we thought we knew about the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes hold 84% of North America's fresh surface water. 30 million people depend on them directly. A massive shipping industry moves hundreds of millions of tons of cargo through their waters annually. For over a century, engineers and scientists monitored these lakes with obsessive precision, building entire cities and infrastructure around one fundamental assumption, that while water levels go up and down, they do so predictably, gradually, within understood limits. That assumption just shattered. Between 2013 and 2020, the lake swung from record-breaking lows to record-breaking highs with a speed that left scientists scrambling for explanations. The shift happened faster than a child finishing elementary school. Every model was wrong. Every projection failed. And now, the question haunting researchers isn't just what happened. It's whether the Great Lakes have entered a completely new regime where the old rules no longer apply. To grasp the magnitude of this crisis, you need to understand the incredible system that was built to manage these waters. The Great Lakes aren't simply large bodies of water sitting passively on the map. They form a massive, interconnected hydrological system monitored by an alphabet soup of agencies. NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, the International Joint Commission, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and dozens more across two countries. Water levels get measured daily at hundreds of stations. Every drop of precipitation across the entire watershed gets tracked. River inflows, channel outflows, evaporation rates, ice coverage, scientists monitor every variable with military precision. This wasn't paranoid over-monitoring. This was necessary because millions of lives and billions of dollars in infrastructure depend on knowing exactly what these lakes are doing. For more than a century, all this monitoring revealed a reassuring pattern. Water levels fluctuated seasonally and over multi-year cycles, typically varying 3 to 4 feet from peak to trough over periods lasting 10 to 15 years. The lakes rose during wet periods and fell during dry ones, always staying within understood ranges that engineers could plan around. This predictability allowed civilization to flourish along the shores. Ports were designed to handle these variations. Municipal water systems built intake structures at depths that would stay submerged during low periods while remaining accessible during high ones. Property developers built homes at elevations deemed safe based on historical maximums plus a safety buffer. The International Joint Commission, established way back in 1909 to manage boundary waters between the U.S. and Canada, regulated outflows through locks and dams to maintain stable levels within this historical range. Plan 2014 represented the pinnacle of this management approach. Implemented to manage Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River, it embodied decades of research and stakeholder input, carefully balancing competing needs, keeping shipping channels deep enough for massive cargo vessels, allowing coastal wetlands their needed periodic flooding, ensuring municipal water intakes stayed submerged, and protecting shorelines from erosion. On paper, it was perfect. The Great Lakes had become among the most carefully managed water bodies on Earth. Even during challenging periods, the system worked. From 1998 to 2013, the lakes experienced a prolonged low water period, reaching some of the lowest levels in recorded history. Yet even these extremes fit within the overall understanding of how the system behaved. Scientists could point to their charts and say, yes, this is low, but it's within the range we expect. During this period, scientists at NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab published models projecting future water levels under various climate scenarios. Most models showed a gradual long-term decline. The logic seemed bulletproof. Warmer temperatures would increase evaporation, reduced winter ice cover would expose more water surface year-round, allowing even more evaporation. Even scenarios with increased precipitation showed stable or slightly declining levels because evaporation would offset the gains. 
These weren't back-of-the-napkin calculations. These models underwent rigorous peer review. They incorporated decades of data. They represented the absolute best understanding of Great Lakes hydrology available to science, and they were completely catastrophically wrong about what would happen next. January 2013 marked the bottom. Lake Michigan Huron reached its lowest level ever recorded, 576.02 feet above sea level, nearly 29 inches below the long-term average. The impacts were immediate and severe. Shipping channels required emergency dredging just to keep cargo moving. Marina owners watched their boats sitting uselessly in mud. Coastal communities that had battled erosion for decades suddenly gained hundreds of feet of new beach. Some celebrated their expanded waterfront. Others worried about what such extreme lows meant for the future. Then something unprecedented began. The levels started rising. Not gradually over decades, as every model suggested changes should occur, but fast, relentlessly, unstoppably. By December 2019, Lake Michigan-Huron had climbed to 581.74 feet, a gain of 5.72 feet in just six years. The following month, January 2020, it reached 582.03 feet, shattering the previous record set back in 1986. This wasn't isolated to one lake. Superior, Erie, and Ontario showed identical patterns, record lows in the early 2010s, record highs by 2020. The entire interconnected system had swung from one extreme to another in less than a decade. These aren't projections or computer simulations. These are hard measurements taken daily by NOAA gauging stations, transmitted to monitoring centers, and posted to public databases that anyone can verify. Nothing in over a century of monitoring had prepared anyone for this rate of change. The transformation was visible to anyone living near the shores. Beaches that had expanded during low water years vanished beneath rising waves. Bluffs that had stood firm for generations began eroding at terrifying rates, 10 to 15 feet per year as waves reached higher, attacking land that had seemed permanently safe. Homes built decades earlier with generous setbacks from the water suddenly found their foundations under direct threat. The 2019 and 2020 storm seasons brought wave action to elevations unprecedented in the modern monitoring period. Seawalls built to withstand historical maximum levels were overtopped like they were sandcastles. Coastal roads flooded. Municipal infrastructure designed for one water regime confronted an entirely different reality. Damage estimates across the basin exceeded $15 billion, and that was just the beginning. The shipping industry faced a complete reversal of their problems. In 2013, low water had forced cargo vessels to reduce loads. You simply cannot fully load a ship when channels are too shallow. By 2020, high water created entirely different challenges. Docks and loading facilities designed for lower levels required expensive emergency modifications. The same ports that had spent millions on dredging in 2013 now dealt with flooding infrastructure. It was like preparing for a drought only to face a flood. NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory scrambled to explain the rapid rise. Yes, precipitation across the basin had increased dramatically, the wettest period on record. But precipitation alone couldn't explain the speed and magnitude of change. Something fundamental about the system's response had shifted. Scientists dove into ice cover data looking for clues. The lakes had been freezing less in winter due to warmer air temperatures. Less ice meant more open water exposed to winter winds, which normally would increase evaporation and lower levels. But somehow, despite reduced ice cover, levels were rising at record rates. The relationship between ice and water levels that had held steady for decades no longer seemed to apply. Evaporation rates showed baffling anomalies. Some years had lower evaporation than expected despite warmer temperatures. Other years had higher evaporation that still didn't prevent record high levels. The simple equation, warmer equals more evaporation equals lower water levels, had broken down completely. With every layer of analysis, the mystery deepened. This wasn't just about more rain. The entire hydrological system was behaving in ways that violated century-old patterns. The human cost mounted daily. 
Coastal communities across eight U.S. states and Ontario faced property damage on a scale that insurance systems were never designed to handle. Homeowners who had bought properties decades ago assured by every expert that they were safely above flood zones watched their life investments literally erode into the lakes. The coordination was unprecedented, federal, state, provincial, and local agencies working together. Billions were invested. The best engineering minds were engaged. Headlines spoke optimistically of communities fighting back, of innovative solutions and climate adaptation leadership. But every solution revealed new problems. Communities investing millions in seawalls during high water years realized those investments became useless if levels dropped back to 2013 lows. Hard structures built to protect against flooding at 582 feet would sit exposed and deteriorating if levels fell to 576 feet. Every fixed structure represented a bet on future conditions that might never materialize. Nature-based solutions required stable enough conditions for vegetation to establish. But if water levels rose or fell several feet in just a few years, plants couldn't adapt fast enough. The same volatility that made hard structures risky also made soft solutions nearly impossible to implement effectively. Researchers examining Saichi events, standing waves that can temporarily raise or lower water levels by several feet in hours, found these becoming more frequent and intense. A Seiche combined with already high water could push waves several feet higher than baseline measurements suggested, causing flooding that seemed to materialize from nowhere. The volatility was compounding itself. The language among scientists and managers shifted subtly but significantly. They stopped talking about returning to normal ranges and started discussing managing increased variability. Then they moved from managing variability to adapting to unpredictability. The question was no longer how to restore the Great Lakes to historical behavior, but how to survive in a system where historical behavior might be gone forever. Six feet in six years. The number hasn't changed, but its meaning has transformed completely. What seemed like a temporary swing between extremes now looks like a fundamental shift in system behavior. The Great Lakes aren't just higher or lower than they used to be. They're more volatile, less predictable, faster to change than a century of careful monitoring suggested was even possible. 30 million people depend directly on these lakes for drinking water, recreation, shipping, fishing, and countless other uses. Billions of dollars in infrastructure, ports, water treatment plants, coastal development, transportation networks were designed for a system that behaved within understood ranges. The new volatility renders much of that infrastructure obsolete or dangerously inadequate. The mathematics are brutally simple and inescapable. Infrastructure designed for stability cannot survive volatility. The only questions remaining are how fast adaptation must happen, who pays for it, and whether adaptation is even possible for a system that won't hold still long enough to adapt to. Every day, NOAA gauging stations measure water levels at hundreds of points across the Great Lakes. Every day, the International Joint Commission monitors conditions and adjusts management strategies. Every day, the gap between the system we thought we understood and the system we actually face becomes more apparent and more dangerous. The Great Lakes still hold 84% of North America's fresh surface water. They still support 30 million people. They still anchor the economy and ecology of an entire region. But the predictable, manageable system that existed for over a century, the system that allowed us to build cities and ports and lives around these shores, may be gone forever. The models predicted gradual decline. Reality delivered wild oscillation. And somewhere between prediction and reality, millions of people are learning that living beside the world's largest freshwater system now means living with an uncertainty that no amount of monitoring, management, or engineering can eliminate. The lakes are still changing. The question is whether we can change fast enough to keep up. That's it for today, folks. See you in the next video.